Olá, super bem-vinda, super bem-vindo. Eu estou super contente, super orgulhoso, porque eu consegui. A gente tem uma entrevista agora com uma autora que eu descobri este ano, é, extremamente é, especial, e eu descobri, claro, pela editora Ainé. Eu tenho que agradecer essa oportunidade da editora, que então me convidou para conversar com a Erika Fatland, que é autora de Sovietistão, que é esse livro que você está vendo aqui, nessa, nessa edição brasileira aqui, obviamente, como tudo da Enel, uma edição super bem acabada. É, se você vir assim na livraria, você vai ver só isso aqui, mas todas as informações estão aqui. E, sobretudo, o que realmente importa está aqui dentro, que é uma viagem maravilhosa, que a Erika fez por uma parte do mundo que eu conheço só um pouquinho, mas que ela explorou como ninguém. So, Erika... Thank you very much for being with us today and thank you very much for this wonderful piece of work here because this is really amazing. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm a reporter in Brazil, a TV reporter, but I also write, and, uh, and I travel a lot. And I was immediately attached to this reading here because it's a part of the world that nobody or, or very few people really explore especially with such sensitivity and, and cleverness as you did. From all the countries you visit, I've been to two of them, Kazakhstan mm -hmm. and Uzbekistan, and I really am you the whole experience you, you brought to us with this book. So, first of all, welcome again. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm very happy my book I'm very happy that my book is out in Brazil. Indeed, indeed. And, and especially because more people can get in touch with first your work and again this part of the world that is very uh, undeserved, little explored, I would say. So we should start at the beginning, the whole idea uh, about writing about this part of the world. And I know you live, you 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 were You, you grow up uh, pretty close to this area of the, wor the world. So I want you to tell me the, the relation you have with this part of the world and the inspiration for the book. Okay, so I'm from Norway and Norway is a neighbor country of Russia. And yeah. I've been fascinated uh, with Russia um, for as long as I can remember because, I mean, it's our neighbor country, but it's a very different world and it's very, very big. And when I went to school, we still had the maps of the Soviet Union. Um, even if the Soviet Union was long gone, we still had the maps. And I remember just looking at those maps and at this big, big world, almost a continent, yeah. and just being very intrigued by that. So I learned Russian and I went to Russia. And then I discovered that I mean, Russia is so much more than just Russians. There are so many people living there. And I don't remember exactly when it happened, but it was one day, the title, Sovietistan, it was just there in my head. And I thought, well, well, that's a very good title, I thought. <laughs> And I thought, well, I want to write a book with this title. Um, so I decided to write Sovietistan about those countries um, in Central Asia, ending with Stan, uh, that were part of the Soviet Union, but um, they have been independent since 1991. And we know nothing about them. So I was very In, curious to find out more. Well, uh, and of course, it's a, it's it's really fascinating. But still, as a journalist, I would say I as, and I I told you I tried to I visit two of these countries, and I I was very concerned about the logistics of it because it's a very difficult trip to take, especially if we think about ten uh, years ago, nine years ago. How long ago was that? It was in 2013, so eight years ago. 13, eight years ago. So again, logistics are very, very complicated. It's not, they're not easy countries to travel in between uh, or within them, right? So once you decided, you got this beautiful inspiration about the name of the book. I mean, would, did you consider the difficulties you would have to, uh, to go through by choosing these countries? Uh, yeah, uh, very much, because um, most of the countries that I were going to visit are dictatorships, so very authoritarian. So I decided to start with the most difficult country, uh, Turkmenistan, which is almost as close as uh, North Korea. And it mm -hmm. can be very difficult to get a visa for Turkmenistan. And the tricky part about Turkmenistan is that they will not tell you if your invitation has been accepted until about... <laughs> two, three weeks before your departure. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> and it's like, it, this, is, this is, and this is just the beginning of it, right? 
Yeah, and of course, also, since I was visiting um, very authoritarian states, I could, of course, never write in the visa application my real mm -hmm. reason for visiting. Uh, so back then, eight years ago, I was still uh, young, so I would write in my application that I was a student. And of course, right. I was very nervous the whole time that they would figure out that I was not a student. And then uh, you, you mentioned this throughout the book a lot. I think it's like you're always suspicious that somebody would get you undercover, and then, and then of, of course, the whole project would be ruined, right? Yes, uh, that luckily never happened. But hmm. I was crossing a lot of land, country borders, and yeah. then when you when you enter a country by air, no one will ask you any questions. But if you cross a physical border. Uh, they will look through all of your luggage and they will be very suspicious. And I remember especially uh, when I was entering Uzbekistan, the last country, and there mm -hmm. was a very tough kind of interrogation. I was asking, so what do you work? And I said, well, I'm a student. And then he started like yelling at me, what? At your age? You're still a student? Well, I have been working since I was 21, serving my family. <laughs> But they did let me in. And that's the most important part. And did you get, of course, I mean, the book was released, uh, when it was released in Norway, 2013, 14? 14, yeah. 14. Did you get any, any repercussion from these countries, from your book? I mean, did you, did, did by any chance, any, any, any uh, reader from Soviet stand wrote you about this book? Actually, after the book was translated to Russian, I did mm. receive many uh, thankful messages from people living in like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And they told me Thank that um, uh, they had learned so much about their own country from reading my book. And of course, that is like the biggest gift or compliment you can get as an exactly. author. But yeah. there was one point after the book was translated to Russian that I would get some very strange messages from people who claim they were students in St. Petersburg. And they would be yeah. like, um, we liked your book very much, um, but there are so few photos. Uh, you don't have any more photos of uh, your Turkmen guides. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, it, uh, not having pictures was an option. You took a few pictures, but very few from the reading. I, I mean, from what I read, this was, was, was not your main idea. You would like, I, I think your, your project was telling about this country more than showing things about this country. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's become a very long book, 500 pages or so. So it's mm -hmm. mainly writings. But I have a few, I don't know, other photos in the Brazilian edition? Uh, not are... really, no, okay. not really. It's just, just words, and, and, and I'm very grateful for these words. And I didn't miss any pictures, indeed, because actually, I mean, maybe some pictures from your adventure and experience you had, but you can find pretty much pictures of these countries, even non-official ones, anywhere on the internet. So that wouldn't be a big concern. And I, I well, and I really liked, I mean, your writing in terms that uh, that was curious. You said some people in Russia wrote to you about, oh, I'm learning so much about my own country or my my former country, and you got a very nice, uh, say, balance between history or facts and your experience. I think. This was one of your concerns as well, because you wanted to inform, to, to introduce these countries to people. But also, it was about you traveling uh, uh, around this country. So how did you get that, that balance right? Oh, uh, well, that's always difficult, uh, because I wanted kind of to present those countries. And since, since I was so lucky, there was no other books about these countries out in the market when Sovietistan was published. So I could write about anything. Nothing was taken. And these yeah. countries, they have a very rich history from the Silk Road and until today. So there was so much to write about. Um, and then the title, Sovietistan, um, also kind of inquired me to write about history, because what I... The question I keep asking throughout mm -hmm. the book is like, what traces are still left of the Soviet Union? Uh, what remains from this huge experiment that these countries were kind of mm -hmm. forced to take part in? Right, and also again, when you when you did make, when you made these questions all around, I think you got mixed answers. Right, some people really miss that whole thing. Some some people really didn't care, and plus, some people it's almost like they never. Uh, a knowledge that they were like invaded or uh, gov governed by Russia because they had such a an isolated lifestyle or culture. So we had like 
many different uh, answers to that question. Am I right? Yeah, um, actually, none of the countries in Central Asia wanted independence from the Soviet Union in the 90s. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so they were quite happy at that moment to be part of the Soviet Union and to receive funding from Moscow. And of course, all of the leaders, uh, the political leaders in those countries, they had been given their power from Moscow. Mm -hmm. So they were mm -hmm. also lucky or happy with the status quo. Uh, mm -hmm. And to this day, um, there are a lot of older people who still miss the Soviet Union. And I think the reason for that is, well, first of all, everyone misses their youth. They were younger yeah. during the Soviet mm. Union. And then secondly, for many people, probably life were better during the Soviet Union. Everyone had a job. Everything was very stable. Everyone could go yeah. on vacation and so on. And now many, in many of those countries, a lot of people are very poor. And now today yeah. you have like in Kazakhstan that you have visited, some people are very rich and some people are very poor. Yeah. So and uh, mo uh, again, many people also depend on Russia for their economy in terms of many, I, 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 you mentioned many examples of people that were, had like husbands or sons, uncles that were like working abroad on Russia and sending money back. So they are also uh, very dependent financially from Russia still on these days, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you travel in Russia, you will meet a lot of migrant workers from Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And I think Tajikistan, which is the poorest of the stands, yes. um, it's the country in the world that is most dependent on the money that migrant workers are sending home. Mm -hmm. So about one to two million out of seven, eight million are working in wow. Russia, uh, mostly men. And of course, then a lot of them, they, they stay in Russia for a long time. Maybe they never come back. Maybe they find a Russian nice lady. Um, still having a family in Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. So a few years ago, um, the president decided that it was forbidden in Tajikistan to divorce someone through through the phone. Yeah, you would actually have to <laughs> meet them personally. <laughs> so, what is that about? It's still this, you know, these things. They're fascinating, but you put them in your whole story, not just like funny facts. But this is actually part of their culture. I mean, it makes totally sense if you live in that place and if you have that heritage. I mean, okay, so there must be a law forbidding you to get divorced through message. So, I love that the way you put everything in context. That's that's what makes the makes the book maybe so wholesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and again, you mentioned Tajikistan, and which is the poorest of, of them all. And I was, I, I must confess, I was devastated by reading this chapter. This is one of the places I, I feel like I would go one day. But your experience there was really, really uh, strong in terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe in Tajikistan w was where where you you felt you felt more maybe. Uh, not compassionate, but more involved. I mean, the way you described your experience in Tajikistan, I, I, I felt like you're like, oh man, she's getting a tough experience there. I mean, uh, it was more, it maybe it's, it's, it's where you were more transparent in your narrative. Uh -huh. Well, Tajikistan is a beautiful country. I would recommend mm -hmm. everyone to go there, but it's quite tough to travel around in Tajikistan because the infrastructure is not very developed and mm -hmm. it's, it's a very poor country. People are very, very friendly. And I think one of the most memorable experiences of the whole trip was when I went to the Yagnobi Valley in Tajikistan. Yeah. And that is a valley that's very isolated. You have to walk there in the winter. You can't access it at all. They are isolated. And mm -hmm. there... I went to these poor villages uh, where these Yagnobi people are living. They are today, um, it's, a, it's a small minority living in um, Tajikistan. They have their own language and so on. Yeah. Um, and then I was invited to, to a wedding on the first day in this valley. And yeah, I felt, I, really got, I felt I really got involved. And I was invited to so many weddings uh, in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan because I, would tra I was traveling in autumn. And mm -hmm. that's the season for weddings because that's when they are slaughtering sheep. So there yeah. was a time when I was invited to a wedding almost every day. <laughs> yeah, as you describe. And I thought that's maybe why I had such a, a, a more intense experience. Because uh, another thing I love about the book is that you tell the stories of these places through 
the human element. I mean, people are there, you see. So I love when you focus on a on a wedding, on this tribe, on the guys, the descendants from Germans. On uh, this, these are like very human stories, and uh, you can yes tell the story of a country. This is what I think a lot uh, while I, when I write or when I do a TV reportage is that. People can tell the story. It's not just facts or books, you see, but you can know Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, whatever, if you tell a good story about people. So I think you were very lucky in finding these characters throughout your, your trip. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think if you read a story, a personal story about someone's life, it just becomes so mm -hmm. much more tangible than if mm -hmm. you're just reading numbers and facts. And, and those Indeed. facts, you can find them in Wikipedia. It's almost it's always more engaging to, to read about someone's life. And it becomes closer, I think. And I'm often asked if it's not like difficult to talk with people who are living in such different cultures. But I find that I mean, people are people everywhere around the earth. And, and people are mostly, I mean, whether they live in Norway or in Tajikistan, their main concern will be their family and health and so on. So we are more alike than we are different. That's very good. I also say, I always say that, and I, I, it feels so good to realize that. Uh, and again, you uh, all these cultures you've, you've visited, uh, you said there was a big Russian influence uh, many, many years, decades, in fact, of, of uh, uh, leadership, co government. But still, I think you were very smart to uh, realize that they have their own culture. I mean, uh, some cultures are even very, very hermetic, very, very close. You see that they, it's, it's almost like they didn't have any influence from the whole Russian past. So do you think these cultures will survive? I mean, sometimes I feel you, you write a little pessimistic about this culture. It's like the, you're most, almost uh, uh, witnessing their their pharaoh or something like that. Um. Well, what happened in 1991 when the Soviet Union broke down was that in many of those countries, the government started like searching for an official culture. So um, mm -hmm. now Kazakhstan is an independent country. Okay, so what is the what is the culture of Kazakhstan? What defines Kazakhstan? Uh, and that happened in many countries. And uh, so one, you could say, problem or issue was then religion, because in all of those countries, they are Muslim today. Yep. And, but of course, during the Soviet uh, Union, um, all kind of, all forms of religions were repressed and yeah. people did not learn so much about their religion. So in the 90s, um, people started searching for their identity. So what does it mean mm -hmm. to be a Muslim? And of course, then the governments were afraid that uh, people would import more, um, say, um, uh, stricter forms of Islam from the Arab countries that were not really uh, original to those places. Meaning in Kyrgyzstan, people used to be nomads. They used to have a very free uh, way of right. life. And today you can actually see the influence from the Arab countries. So that's changing. But cultures are always changing. No, I know. And I, especially being from Brazil, you know, just, uh, have you been to Brazil, actually? No, I not have. yet. Um, I yeah. have. Um, Ten years ago, uh, my sister's boyfriend is from Brazil. Uh, he lives right. in Norway now. And ah. I, um, so I feel that I have family in Brazil. <laughs> Do you remember what, what part of the countries you visited? Uh, so, yeah, I visited him. In, he's from the south, uh, Florianopolis. So I visited yes, him there. Yeah, uh -huh. And then I visited the Rio. And then I went to the Amazon, uh, which was an adventure Amazing. with my sister. Oh, great. All right. That was a great experience. So that, but so you know a little bit of what, uh, about what I'm going to talk about. We, have, we, such a big, we are such a big country, and many cultures also mix in, this, in this, this big culture. And I don't regret the fact that some countries die or anything, but, and, they, and I totally agree with you that they evolve into something else. What I think it's beautiful, and in your book you also show a little bit of that, that some people still try to to preserve some cultures and this is this is very beautiful younger generations maybe are more uh careless about this maybe but still to, uh, that's what i was asking you uh the first time you you, you see hope in that i mean e either kazakhstan or uzbekistan they will evolve into something new or will they remain in the past Oh, um, well, I think that they will definitely re revolve into something new. And now mm -hmm. it's very interesting because now in Russia, in, in, in Central Asia, you have a totally new generation growing up. 
who cannot remember the Soviet Union because they didn't live through the Soviet Union. So yeah. they are not then, they don't have this luggage uh, of the Soviet past. Uh, so of course they will then shape their countries in the future. Uh, one problem in Central Asia today is that the leaders um, are still from the Soviet generation and some of them like in Tajikistan have remained in power since uh, the Soviet Union. So yeah, I, mean, um, I think it's a very good thing that this um, is changing slowly. You, you, you say in many countries, you, you, you're very uh, sensible to uh, repression, right? The way people talk about the government, government or not. Most of the times they even not, don't speak about that. Uh, and of course, being undercover, it didn't force or it didn't really uh, make clear you were interested in that subject. How did you feel? Uh, is this all over the five countries? I, there were differences between uh, levels of repression. Uh, so how did you feel? Is, are people still isolated politically? I mean, they're not. Are they? do you think that there's hope that they can be a little bit more open, a little bit more open? Well, let's start with Turkmenistan, which is mm -hmm. like the North Korea of uh, Central Asia. Uh, <laughs> so that's an extremely authoritarian regime. And to this day, uh, like North Korea, they have still not reported any COVID-19 cases, um, yeah, which of yeah. course says a lot about the, the regime. Indeed. And they are ruled. Of, it's interesting with uh, Turkmenistan because they were ruled by a crazy leader, Turkmen Bashi. Uh, he was uh, he got to power. He rose to power in the 1980s during the Soviet Union, and then when uh, Turkmenistan got independent in 1991, he just mm -hmm. uh, changed his job title from uh, secretary of the Communist Party to president of Turkmenistan, and yeah. he changed the name of his party from the Communist Party to the Democratic Party, and voila. Uh, Turkmenistan was an on paper a democracy, but now uh, no one in Moscow was like you know, holding his ears any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so he just grew crazier and crazier, and he started a cult around his own personality, uh, making gold statues of himself, uh, renaming yeah. the days of the street and the month. So, and um, if you had, if you wanted to buy bread, uh, you had to go to the shop, and um, you couldn't buy a borek uh, any chorek anymore. You had to buy a Gurban Zoltan Edge, which was the full name of his mother. So he was absolutely crazy. He wrote a book that he forced everyone to read. And then he died in 2006, and I think probably a lot of people were secretly happy that he was dead. And then, um, interestingly, his dentist became president. Right, and, and got and, even a little bit more crazy, I would say. <laughs> yes, because to, to begin with, there was hope that maybe Turkmenistan would change for the better. Um, but he very soon started making statues of his, of himself as well. Um, okay. He took a name, um, Arkadag, which means the protector. Um, and so today, Turkmenistan just gets uh, worse and worse under his regime. And he, I mean, he's in he's on the front of the newspaper every day. So it's really a uh -huh. single of Korea. Of course, but actually, one of the most like bizarre stories you tell in your book is in Turkmenistan, I guess. It was that day of the, the horse parade or horse championship, whatever. And when this gentleman fell from his horse, and of course, there was no record of this event. If you weren't there to witness yourself, it, it would be like it would never existed. Yes, I, the day of the horse, uh, it's an official celebration yes. in Turkmenistan. The horse, they have their own breed, the Akalteke, and they are very proud of, the president is very proud of this horse. And he, of course, rides himself. And then on the day of the horse, uh, the first race was a very special race uh, where the president was participating too. He, of course, entered at last and everyone had to be waiting for him for hours and hours. And then finally he came, everyone <laughs> applauding politely. And um, I think I remember correctly, the prize uh, of the first prize was... 11 million dollars or something like that so it was a big prize but you know everyone knew who was going to win and i could see it was not a long race of 400 meters or something like that and i could uh, see how the other riders they were holding back their horses so that the president could win but then as he crossed the line he made a little movement in his saddle 
and uh, the horse tripped and fell and the president flew over his head, landed on the ground and was just laying there. And it was impossible to see if he was alive or dead. And I just remember that silence of every, everyone panicked. Do we have a dictator or not? What's going on? And then after something like that, felt like a very, very, very long time into this uh, big new marble, um, what's the name, stadium. Uh, came a Soviet ambulance <laughs> driving to get the, fetch the president, and off they went. And then for an hour or so, no one knew what was going on. Um, and and then he came back and, and held a speech. But you could you could tell that he had uh, taken a lot of painkillers. <laughs> Even if I don't understand Turkmen, I could understand that. But uh, again, if, when you, if you go and if you go on YouTube and you search for Turkmen president falling off horse, you can see it because there was one Turkish journalist who managed to smuggle out the video. As as everybody who was like was that you were did you take take picture of that of that event now were you recording or something? I didn't dare to because I was surrounded by some very serious Turkmen men in black suits and You're they right. looked uh, very strict on me when I touched my camera. So I didn't dare to, and everyone so did take. Everyone who did take photos, they were escorted to another room afterwards and forced to delete the photos. No, of course they would. <laughs> But listen, stories like that, they are all throughout the book. I mean, this is from the first chapter, of course. But in every country, you were able, you were lucky and smart, of course, to find stories like that and put them in perspective. Again, it's very easy to make fun of these countries. And something that I really like about a book is, like, you put perspective. I mean, it's, it would be very easy to do, like, Borat 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, you see? But, again, you, you, were, you were sensible enough to say, this pe there are people there. They are weird. Uh, but they also suffer, and they are going through a very difficult period of history for themselves. I mean, there's a little. Sometimes it, it, it shows, and I'm wrapping up right now. But it, sometimes it shows you have a little hope for these countries. But this is something that us journalists, we still, whenever we write about even a desolate place, we do hope that they get better, they improve somehow. And I could see in part of the writing that you you like you say, okay, let's see if that goes through, if it gets better. Well, one, one must always hope that things will change. Uh, one of the saddest um, interviews that I made uh, during the trip was in Kyrgyzstan, mm -hmm. because Kyrgyzstan is the only democracy uh, of the Stan countries. And uh, they actually had, even last year, they had another revolution, the third revolution, throwing right. the president. Uh, so they are very active. Um, but even if um, Kyrgyzstan is the freest countries, of the countries, uh, the women in Kyrgyzstan are probably the least free women in Central Asia. And they have a tradition called Alakachu, uh, mm. which means bride snatching. And it's really a terrible tradition. I don't even want to call it tradition where men uh, who wants a wife and who just wants a wife quickly and easy, they just yeah. snatch a wife. And from one day to the other, uh, that woman's life is totally changed. So what happens is that the only person who doesn't know that she's getting married that day is the bride. So oh, right. I, talked to, I talked to several women. One woman told me she was uh, just walking uh, home. No, I, uh, another story. I was one woman who was invited to her friend's, her best friend's engagement party. And then the guy, the friend was getting engaged to, asked if she could come out to the street. And then he kidnapped her because that, that engagement was, party, that was just a I was, I was I was shocked to read that. I was actually shocked to read that. And yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't know about that. Just, it was <laughs> absolutely terrible. And then they, they took that girl into a van that was waiting and they drove off to the village of that man. And mm -hmm. when they arrived to the village, she was crying. Uh, yeah. The... the the, the wedding had already started and the guests were eating and having a good time. So everyone knew about this plan, except for the but, girl. Sorry. Yeah, but the girl. That's horrible. But this also... But, but, this, but just to talk about hope, better. just to yeah. talk about hope, yeah. um, what is a good thing now in Kyrgyzstan is that there has been a lot of protests uh, for women's rights the last few years. So mm -hmm. this tradition is hopefully uh, disappearing forever. Change comes. One day change do come, which is really good. So again, uh, I'm really 
happy to talk to you, Erica. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And as a journalist, as a traveler, I would speak. I would speak to you. I mean, for like full day or week. I'm just curious about where will your uh, uh, where curiosity take you now? Where where is your curiosity taking you now? Do you have new projects? Uh, more, perhaps some new books coming up. Oh, well, uh, my Brazilian translator just told me yesterday that he had uh, yesterday started on the new translation of uh, my second book, uh, The Border, which is a, mm -hmm. a journey around the border of Russia from North Korea through exactly. all of the 14 neighboring countries, all the way to Norway. Mm -hmm. So um, he's very quick. Uh, he's a very good translator and he's very fast. So hopefully the book will be available in Brazil very soon. Very good. And a good translator, too, as well, because this was an amazing read. And again, this is Sovietistan, Sovietistan, uh, from Erica Fetland. Uh, actually, and I really, I'm, I'm being very, very honest here, one of the best books I read this year. Thank you very much. As your brother-in-law uh, is Brazilian, so you're aware a little bit of maybe our language, I would say, obrigado to you. Obrigada. <laughs> And I hope to really talk to you soon now about the new book and the coming up. And uh, I wish you a lot of luck in your new project. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you so much, Zeka. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.